Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes, but she says hello today with a program that looks at Israel, we look at the news. And by the way, folks, we're still in the midst of this coronavirus issue and we still have our masks, but we don't have them on today. It's just so you can see our faces and uh, carrying around this cream and all this kind of things. Well, in the Jerusalem Post, uh, other than coronavirus, there has been the issue of annexation. It's, this is the uh, headline from the Jerusalem Post. It says, Israel will not st start annexation in July, U.S. officials tell the Jerusalem Post. And um, we, uh, we're in the situation where annex, uh, the uh, sovereignty movement are pressing for it. And uh, we're going to be talking in the program today, especially about the annexation, about the sovereignty, about Judea and Samaria. And in the studio, we have a very special guest, Ambassador Ido Aharoni. Thank you so much for coming across and joining us today, sure. being our expert and telling us all about Judea and Samaria, sovereignty and annexation. Uh, Ido Aharoni was Israel's longest serving consul general in New York. He held the position with the rank of ambassador for six years, overseeing the operations of Israel's largest diplomatic mission worldwide. He serves as a professor of international relations at New York's University Graduate School of Arts. And so we're so grateful that you're here and not in New York. And uh, he is the founder of Brand Israel, has been featured in the Jerusalem Post been featured in Time Magazine, The Washington Times, The New York Post, as well as CNN, CBN, Al Jazeera, Bloomberg TV, Fox News, and I-24, amongst others, and many other networks that you've been on. So we really appreciate you giving us your time today. So maybe you can tell us, just before we get into sovereignty, a little bit about yourself, and, uh, and, and we can share with the viewers your background. Sure, sure. So first of all, thank you for having me, and thank you for um, having this very casual interview, which I really like, because usually, you know, I'm sitting in a studio with a suit and a tie, but this is really fun, and it's close to home. So I was born in 1962 in Tel Aviv. I came to Jerusalem to join the Foreign Service, um, served in the Army, like most Israelis. Um, went to Tel Aviv University for my first degree, and then to Emerson College in Boston for my master's degree. I then worked for Israeli television and joined the Foreign Service in 1991. I spent 25 years with the Foreign Service. All of my overseas postings were in the United States, which makes me kind of unique in that sense. Um, and I retired four years ago, and I'm combining academics with consultancy and some public speaking and so on. So I retired. I'm very happy. Uh, to uh, at least pre-COVID-19, I traveled extensively all over the world, uh, attending conferences, speaking, and lecturing, and so on. So um, things are great. And uh, obviously, uh, due to COVID-19, I'm here since March. Wow. So we, we, whilst we don't appreciate COVID-19, we really appreciate you being available because it's such, a, such an important topic, and it's something we've spoken about before. And maybe I'll just mention very uh, quickly the uh, two particular uh, plans. I know you've seen them before, but very, very important. This is the, the first one which we've talked about on previous programs is the vision for peace, uh, Trump's peace plan in particular. You can see uh, these particular areas uh, in green. Uh, we've talked about that, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, and then the other diagram what I've referred to in the program is the uh, map of Judea and Samaria. As you can see, this is a, a huge area, really, Edo. And so maybe you can talk us a bit about, because for a lot of people, it can be very confusing. And uh, there's all sorts of terms we use, the West Bank, annexation, sovereignty, Judea and Samaria. So maybe you can talk us a bit about the Trump's peace plan. That's, I believe, is on the table at the moment. That's still, it's still there as far as we know. Well, you know, since the the, the so-called Trump peace plan was introduced, several things happened. The coronavirus uh, erupted and uh, the outbreak of the virus changed everything. It also brought about a unprecedented economic devastation. So the lockdown, regardless of the health issue created by COVID-19, the mm -hmm. lockdown created a whole new set of problems. And on top of it, this is election year. Donald Trump uh, wants to be reelected. And so I would say that if I had to judge 
you know, by his set of priorities, um, the implementation of the so-called Trump plan, because I don't really know to what extent Trump himself was involved in the, in the plan, uh, the implementation of it is not a top priority for him right now, uh, which is perhaps the reason why the uh, announcement of the uh, Israeli government to implement some sort of annexation, at least when it comes to the Jordan Valley, uh, on July 1st uh, never happened. Right. And, and, I, and I think it's very important for, for you at home to understand that Judea and Samaria, is it, we're not talking about another country or Jordan or uh, Lebanon or parts of Egypt. We're, this is the heartland of Israel. There's the Jerusalems in there. Uh, where we're filming today's in Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria is a huge chunk of Israel. And um, there's, we've got all the legal ramifications from San Remo and the League of Nations, United Nations. So it's very important that Israel has this, e e even if it's just on a defensible borders basis. And um, Yeah, so, you know, in foreign policy, you always have to look at things from two different angles. The, the first is the obviously the historical angle, the legal angle, where cold historical facts, um, you know, have a serious weight, and this is really what determines your policy. And um, and I can say that over the years we've had many political leaders who were ideological, like Menachem Begin was ideological, David Ben Gurion certainly was ideological. And they, um, and they operated in light of this grand ideology or uh, grand overarching principle. And they would have told you, if they were here in the studio instead of myself, that uh, the, the discussion about what is the historical land of Israel is really um, uh, um, an open discussion because uh, people have different opinions. Uh, but there's no question that at one time, the land of Israel was much bigger than what it is today in terms of the sovereignty of the Jewish people. And then you have the other angle, right? So here you have the historical, ideological angle. And then you have the, the other angle. It's called realpolitik, a foreign policy that is looking to do what is right in terms of the self-interest of the state of Israel. Right? There's a land of Israel, but the political entity that was created in 1945 and 1948 is called the land of the state of Israel, not the land of Israel. Two different things. And so the question is, how can they peacefully coexist, the land of Israel and the state of Israel, with the international community, with the constraints? And of course, that struggle never ended. It goes with us since the very beginning, since the very inception of the state of Israel. Wow. And um, you, you were very involved with the, the rebranding of Israel. That was your, the, big, the big thing that you were involved with. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Why, what, why did Israel need rebranding? And what, tell us a bit about the, the work so, you've done with that, because that's, that kind of is relevant to sovereignty yeah. in a way because of people's perception of Israel. Right. So when I joined the Foreign Service in 1991, um, I went to what's called the cadet course. It's a two-year program, training program, and the idea is to make sure that all the new recruits are on the same page. And I thought it was very strange that we were told that our job in the first place is to be the analysts of the Middle East and the experts on Israel's predicament in the Middle East and the experts on the conflict and so on and so forth. And I thought it was strange because, um, you know, I came from America, I was a student in America, my wife is America, and I spent a lot of time in America, and I spent a lot of time in the American media. And I knew for sure that the Middle East is not a top priority for the American people and not for the American media. And in fact, when someone opens, you know, takes a, a newspaper or, or, or turn on their TV set, the first thing that they actually watch is probably sports maybe food, uh, they read a lot about lifestyle and fashion, about health, uh, and the Middle East is not a top priority. And so it, you know, it stayed with me. And then after 9-11, when I was in New York, I realized that 9-11 had really fundamentally changed the positioning of the entire Middle East in the eyes of the American people and the rest of the Western world. 
and I wanted to know what was the impact. And what I discovered was very, very interesting. I discovered that the more we're trying to convince the other mm -hmm. that in the conflict we are right and they are wrong, the more we fortify and reinforce the association of Israel with the context of conflict. Right. Imagine this, imagine this. Imagine the mayor of Chicago um, holding a press conference every day in which she is reporting about the success of the Chicago Police Department dealing with crime. So although her press conference would contain very positive message, here I am reporting about the success of Chicago defeating crime. But imagine if she had done that every day, not nationally, internationally, for the next 40 years, what would happen to Chicago's positioning in the world? Chicago will be forever associated with crime. That's exactly what happened to us voluntarily. In other words, we told a story to the world that centered around our problems. That story was not beneficial to Israel's economy. It was not beneficial to Israel's tourism industry, which is the single largest industry in the country. It was not beneficial to Israel's political positioning in the world and certainly not to the amount of goodwill that the world was willing to show us. In other words, we self-inflicted harm on the image and the standing of Israel worldwide. Why? Because at the time, at that very specific time when we were dealing with the Palestinians, there were tens of other active national, tribal, economic, religious conflicts all over the world. And we claimed, we claimed that our conflict was the most important conflict. How do I know that? I looked very curiously at all the speeches that Israel's leaders gave at the United Nations. Look at the content. What was it that they discussed with the world? From Ben-Gurion all the way to Netanyahu. I'll tell you, Israel's problems. So here you are, given a chance to showcase your nation to the world, and the only thing you choose to do is talk about the problems. There's something wrong with that strategy. So we decided to go back to Marketing 101, the basics of marketing. We discovered that in marketing, in fact, the number one rule is never, never discuss the problems of your product, idea, concept, ideology, political platform, whatever it is that you're trying to market, right. you never put the problems first. So that's the first problem that we discussed. So we decided... But did you, did you have opposition to that? Because this oh, is yeah. a whole revolution of, uh, of way course, of thinking. Of course. The first pushback came from my own colleagues in the foreign ministry. They thought that this was crazy. First of all, some of them said, oh, we've been doing this for years, talking about Israel. No. This was never the strategy. There's a big difference, and we Israelis have a huge problem understanding the real meaning of the word strategy because we're all with military background, and in the military, everything is about tactics. Israelis confuse tactics with strategy. So Israeli creativity is the one thing that could connect people emotionally to Israel because what we discovered through research, global research, is that people do not connect to legal arguments and historical facts. Wow. So the fact that I'm right doesn't make me likable. You have to celebrate your contributions, your qualities, and make sure that the world is aware of your offerings. What is it that you're offering the world? Just problems? Conflicts? It's not attractive. You can't say to the world, we are on the verge of extinction because of Iran, because of Hezbollah, because of Hamas, and then expect millions of tourists to come here. Right. It just doesn't go together. So, so did, you, did you start doing that uh, on an individual basis or was that something your office took so, up? Or? So what happened was I was in New York. I created a group because I needed support and I had no money. And remember, the first pushback came from my own colleagues in the foreign ministry, not all of them, but most of them. And on Madison Avenue, um, you will find the best sociologists and psychologists of the industry. The best people work on Madison Avenue. And we, and we were able to, because many of them were Jewish and many of them were connected to Israel, we were able to recruit several brilliant minds to work with us as consultants, as volunteers. And they really created 
fascinating work, uh, strategic work. And, uh, and it was clear to us by, already by 2004 that we needed to change the way we communicated our message to the world and to do two things. The first is to begin a long-term strategic celebration of Israel's advantages rather than just complain about the problems. Let's celebrate the contributions and the offers. But no less importantly, we understood that the mission really is systematically bring influencers to Israel because around that time, the famous echo chamber was created. By 2007, the first smartphone was introduced. So influencers in social media became increasingly more and more important and more and more influential. And there was a right. need to bring them to Israel, to see Israel for themselves, because that was the main barrier. I can give you many examples of how um, Israel paid a very heavy price for its obsession with the conflict. Um, now, again, I'm not saying that the conflict doesn't exist. I'm not right. saying that we should ignore the conflict. I'm not saying that the conflict is not, uh, uh, does not require a diplomatic treatment. All I'm saying is, does it make any sense for Israel to turn the conflict into the centerpiece of its communications with the world? Mm -hmm. Because the world doesn't care. Right. And it only scares people away. So did, did, you, did you emphasize tourism or? Yes. So we emphasized tourism. Right. We emphasized cultural exchange exposure of Israeli cultural assets, helping leading Israeli export brands in the world that was a big part of my job. And the most important thing, which we failed, and hopefully after COVID-19, uh, the government will uh, take this on as a major national project, which is the um, a study abroad programs. There are millions of students from all over the world that travel every year to study abroad. In the United right. States, about 750,000 of them. They travel to study abroad, they go to Italy, they go to England, they go to Egypt. How many of them? Nearly one million. How many of them come to Israel? Less than 3,000. Uh, which is, again, a severe example of underperformance related to that barrier I'm talking about, which is a conflict. A lot of people, again, think that Israel is not a safe place. Why? Israel is much safer than Chicago. Israel is much safer than Detroit. Israel is much safer than the Bronx in New York. Believe me, when I came to New York, I had to sign a document that I will never go to the Bronx, to certain parts of the Bronx. Right. And I had to sign that document for the Israeli Ministry of Defense, who mm -hmm. was in charge of protecting me as an Israeli diplomat. So Israel is one of the safest places. Yeah, this is, this is, you know, when we first came here, uh, the children in England, we wouldn't let them go on a, on a bus at night but, uh, after 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the evening. And here they were traveling in Jerusalem in midnight and little children with their parents out at midnight. So, it, but you, if you tell people that, they, they find it unbelievable because in their own situation, they couldn't do that. Yeah, and, and we're paying the price. We're paying that price um, and, the, and, the, and the sad thing is that the Israelis themselves are not even aware of the price that we're paying as a, as, a, as a nation, as an economy, as a collective, as a society for that horrible mistake. And it's a lot completely of the, unnecessary. A lot of the journalists are taken to the, see the conflict areas. They're taken, or they ask, uh, uh, to be fair, uh, they ask to see all these conflict areas. And then, unfortunately, it gives this wrong impression when people are living very happily just a few miles away, then, uh, then there's a few stones thrown. Right. And I, By the I, way, I have no beef with journalists who come and say, I'm interested in the conflict. It's not a problem. That's uh, part of who we are. The conflict is part of the reality. My addition was to say, wait a second, if we're going to spend money on bringing people here. We make sure, we better make sure that we're bringing people that write about Israeli food and write about Israeli culture right. and write about Israeli ethnicity and religion and all the other things that are not related to the conflict because the conflict got its chair already. You know, the conflict is already very now, prominently featured. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of you watching today, a lot of the viewers, Ida, will be saying, you know, we're Israeli advocates. We're trying to promote Israel. What's the best way they can, they can get information to promote, like you're saying, a positive image of Israel? Uh, what's the best way they can do that? The, thank God 
the internet was introduced and the smartphone was introduced in 2007. The best thing that people who want to help Israel can do is be themselves, is simply create content about their own lives, about their own passions, about their own good feelings about this place, and turn it into something very personal. Because what happened in 2007 is that the monopoly that up until that point was in the hands of a handful of people, the political leaders, the pundits, the commentators, the columnists of the newspapers, here and there. That monopoly, and maybe five, six hundred people were in charge, really. They dominated the conversation about Israel in the world through the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. That monopoly was taken away from them and was given to whom? To us, the people. And now, once you have your own personal individual feed and you have your own access to social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever, you can actually become a co-producer of content. And that's why we see since 2007, it's scientific, since 2007, we see gradual growth in incoming tourism to Israel every year. This year, we were supposed to be at 5 million wow. mark, at the 5 million mark. And when we started with Brand Israel in 2002, 2003, we had one, less than a million tourists a year. Wow. So we were supposed to have 5 million this year because of COVID-19. We're not going to have 5 million. But the point is that that growth is not a result of anything but technology. It's not about what the government does. It's not about Israel. It's about one very simple fact. When Israel is being communicated to the world authentically in an uncensored fashion by the Israelis themselves, good things happen. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, very good stories that are happening with the high tech. There's the mobile eye and there's uh, other high tech success stories that have uh, just, well, you could name them one after another that Israel has been involved in and with the mobile phone. Uh, antivirus with the computer, computer technology, right. uh, medical advances. So here's another example, and you're absolutely correct. The, um, so the technological breakthroughs that came out of Israel are mind-boggling. I mean, you yourself mentioned Israel introduced to the world the first computer firewall, right, invented by Checkpoint. Um, Israel made a tremendous contribution to the creation of the first cellular phone in Motorola, office in Israel. Israel introduced Mobileye, which is a uh, uh, really a game-changing 360 protection, the anti-collision protection uh, system for cars. Israel introduced Waze, which is a combination of GPS and uh, uh, crowdsourcing, um, which is a, a, a new concept. That it was a new concept at the time. And I, Israel, uh, the, perhaps the most important invention that came out of Israel is instant messaging. Uh, which was created in 1999 by an Israeli company, ICQ, that doesn't exist anymore. It was purchased by AOL. Um, but, you know, without instant messaging, all of the things that you see today would not have existed. Instant messaging changed the world. This is perhaps when, when historians will look at technologies that come out, came out of Israel, instant messaging will be number one because it really changed communications, human communications. Now, how much money do you think the invention of instant messaging is worth? I would argue trillions. Historically, when you, mm. when, when you, when you will look at it 100 years from today, you will say that should have been worth trillions of dollars. Yet Israel, with all of its technological prowess, is not able to attract the kind of foreign investment that it deserves. We're not even beginning to scratch the potential. And I said it before, and I am saying it again, Israel should be able to attract a quarter of a trillion dollars every year. This is not an imaginary number. This is what the Israeli high-tech sector really deserves. Mm -hmm. We have over 6,000 startups here. Um, we have a vibrant academic foundation we have technology transfer companies with every university, every college, tens of companies like that. The amount of innovation is mind boggling and the world is responding in a very, very limited way. 
And mm -hmm. I'll say one more thing about that. Israeli innovation is also inexpensive when you compare Israeli innovation to innovation, let's say, in Silicon Valley. Same company, let's say a company in the area of fintech that does the same thing, same solution to the same problem, would cost here 30, 40 percent less than it would cost in Silicon Valley. Wow. And still, we're not attractive enough to bring those hundreds of, hundreds of billions into the Israeli economy every year, which we really deserve. And so I think that the main reason for that is the same psychological barrier right. posed by the, the notion that Israel is a conflict-stricken place. Yes, we have and conflicts. And that's why the, the risk manager will say, wait a minute, if it's Israel, we need to be a bit careful. We started in 1948 with 550,000 Jews here, um, 650,000 citizens. When I was born in 1962, there were 2.7 million. When the Yom Kippur War broke out in October of 1973, Israel was 3.1 million. Today, we're 9.2 million. Wow. By 2048, when we will celebrate 100 years, we are projected to be 17 million. And by 2065, we're projected to have 20 million. So if you ask me, people have money, want to invest it's residential. A, it's a great place to invest. Residential real estate. That's where, <laughs> where, that's where they should invest. Wow. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching today, then that's certainly something that you should think about. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ido, for being our guest today. Thank uh, you. Talking about the, um, the sovereignty at the beginning and then the rebranding of Israel and the importance of mentioning the good things that are happening. And even maybe in your own life, making, mentioning the good things, it's, all, it's a really a, a positive thing. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the program, then visit our website, www.israelfirst.org. Email us. We love to receive your emails. That's info at israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language.